So if you have technology, I want you to take it out. Um, I want you to go online. Uh, I want you to really engage in this presentation um, in a couple of ways. Uh, the first is through Twitter. Um, how many of you have a Twitter account that you use on a regular basis? Okay, so those few of you who have Twitter accounts. Uh, the hashtag is NWAIS13, and I won't try to pronounce that. Um, <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, uh, please tweet out anything that uh, resonates or any links or anything else from this presentation there, if you will. And for those of you who want to engage in a back channel chat, how many of you have done a back channel in the past where you're having a conversation while the speaker is speaking? All right, so I'm going to invite you to do that. And uh, I'm going to encourage you to do that, actually, because we're going to try to model some of the opportunities for us to connect and to have uh, to share ideas and whatever else. Please don't feel it rude if you're nose deep in your computers while I'm talking. Um, basically, if that helps you or if that, if that pushes your thinking and allows you to get more out of this presentation, feel free to do that. So that's at todaysmeet.com slash NWAIS13. And for those of you that haven't seen a back channel, this is pretty much what it looks like. Pretty much when you get in there, it asks you to join. You just put your name in there and um, use your real name, own your ideas. I've had a lot of really interesting people in my back channel chats, lots of movie stars, and I think Miley Cyrus was in one last week, actually. Um, so use your real names, and, uh, and then just type a message, and just hit say. And what will happen is you'll begin to have a conversation with people in the room, uh, assuming, of course, that the bandwidth holds. That's the interesting question. And there we go. And maybe that's me. That's probably me. Um, so, yeah. Okay, are we having troubles with that? Okay, so on to the presentation. Um, if it works, it works. If not, by the way, today's meet is totally free, easy to use. If you want to play with back channeling at your schools, it's a great site to start, all right? And just play around with that, because sincerely, it's a, it's a pretty interesting way of, of starting some conversations. All right, hold on. Now I'm really all messed up here. Isn't this great? Huh? Well, that's not the network. That's something else going on. Yeah, I knew someone was going to say that. Technology, right? Okay. Not sure why that's happening, but I'm going to have to reboot. So anyway, here we go. Um, I want to start with a quote by Margaret Wheatley. Any of you read Willing to be Disturbed, by the way? Have you heard of this essay, Margaret Wheatley? Okay, so she has this great essay where she says, the only way that we can begin to really change is if we allow ourselves to be confused. And um, I think that, that one of the things that's happening in education right now, to be honest with you, is that we're not confused enough about what's happening in the world in terms of technology and learning. So um, what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna try to confuse you, and I know that uh, you probably haven't heard too many speakers come in and say that, but that is going to try, I'm going to try to make that my, my goal today, and I'm going to try to make that a healthy confusion, not something that's going to make you kind of run for the exits. But it's important, I think, that basically we are looking at the world a little bit differently, and we're asking some different questions from the ways in which um, we've been asking them before about education. So I think this is going to open up, I think I can pop this back in, and I think hopefully we'll be ready to go here in just one second. That wasn't too bad, assuming that it was. All right, I know. Sometimes it happens. I'm modeling what you do when the technology doesn't work, right? All right, so there we go. Okay, so we can't be creative if we refuse to be confused, and change always starts with confusion. Now, I'm going to tell you straight off that my thesis here is that we're not confused enough and that we really need to start thinking differently about what happens in schools. And this is basically the, the reason that I'm confused. I own two teenagers at the moment. Do any of you own two teenagers, by the way? All right, so if you own two teenagers and you're not confused, please come and talk to me after the session because um, this is my daughter, Tess, my son, Tucker, she's 16, he's 14. We always take pictures of my kids when they're both happy at the same time. I don't know about you guys. Um, I think this is number seven in the series, to be honest with you. <laughs> Um, it's a wonderful moment when my kids are both smiling, so we try to capture that. But, you know, here's my confusion about their worlds and their education. For instance, why is it that school is the only place in my kids' lives 
or they can't take the technology out of their pockets and backpacks to answer the questions that they're being asked. So, many, so much of the stuff that my kids do in school, so many of the things that they bring home, when I look at it, I wonder, why aren't they allowed to take the technology out? Because if they were asked those questions at home, that's exactly what they would do in their real worlds. But yet, we're asking a lot of stuff that basically makes no sense in terms of carrying it around in their brains any longer when they have access. Now, I know a lot of people say, well, what if they don't have access? And I'm not saying that we throw all content out, but there are lots of things now that I wonder, why are we teaching this stuff? Why does my daughter need to know so much about Grover Cleveland? Um, you know, uh, there may be a reason for it, but basically she can learn about Grover Cleveland anytime that she wants, and so that's just part of the confusion that I have. Why doesn't school look more like real life when it comes to the, the, the sense of, of what they can do with technology? So here's some of my biases, just so you know. I think this may be the most disruptive moment ever in education, seriously. Um, if you don't feel disrupted, if you don't feel confused a little bit already, um, I would humbly suggest and respectfully suggest you're not paying attention. Because there are all sorts of things that are happening in a learning and education uh, context that are challenging your very roles as teachers in the classroom, that are pushing the definitions of what you do and what your role is and what your service is to the kids in your classroom. Now, at the same time, kind of antithetical to that, I also think this is the most amazing time to be a learner ever. I can't imagine there's been a better time to learn things. And I look at my kids all the time when they come home and they have a passion or an interest to find something or to do something, play Minecraft. Any Minecraft parents in the room? There's another support group you can have, right? They just go and learn it. And it's not like me when I was a kid growing up, asking my mother on a regular basis, can you take me to the library? Because that's where all the information was, and that's where all the stuff was. Now it's like, just go online and find it. It's an amazing time to be a learner. And I feel honored and privileged to be, have been a learner in these contexts now for about 13 years. It's pretty cool. I do think schools are the most important parts of our communities, whether those are public schools, parochial schools, independent schools. Schools are just crucially important in our society. I was at a conference actually last week at Bard College where they were talking about democracy in schools. And um, Richard Rodriguez, do you guys know Richard Rodriguez? He's he an essayist and an author. He was speaking and he said, interestingly, he said, private schools are where kids go to get a public education. And as a 23-year public school educator, to be honest with you, I, I just went, oh, that hurts. Um, but the public schools right now are under duress by policy and by um, all sorts of testing and whatever else, it makes it very difficult for kids to get a public education in public schools any longer. And you guys probably have more freedom to really do that work with kids. Um, and that's important, important work in this country, especially at this moment when we are so dysfunctional in lots of different ways when it comes to the way we're running our democracy right now. Um, but schools need to be different, not better. I'm here to tell you, stop trying to be better than you were last year. Start trying to be different from what you were last year. Start thinking differently because, again, the role of school is changing. It has to change right now. This is not an option, as I'm going to say later on as well. We have to begin to think differently about schools because the role and the, and the, the context under which schools were created is no longer the context that my kids and that we live in and learn in right now. Uh, and this one is really hard, but I've come to believe more and more that our own histories and our own narratives around our own education are now getting in the way of what we do for our kids. We can't want the same education for our kids that we have. I can't, I can't look at my kids and say, I want you to have the same experience that I had from, from years ago, <laughs> right? Um, Basically, I want them to have a different experience because they need different things. They need different literacies. They need different experiences. The expectations on them are different in their lives right now. And finally, this might be the most worrisome of all, is that I think our understanding as educators of the contexts that we're dealing with right now are kind of dangerously, dangerously inadequate. And I'm not, gonna, I'm, I'm not throwing any of you under the bus because you don't have Twitter accounts. I'm not. But I'm surprised that 20 people in this room have Twitter accounts that they use on a regular basis. It suggests to me that not many of you are connected in the ways that I'm going to talk about. And to me, that's concerning. Because I wonder how we can make decisions about what happens in our classroom for kids in an era of technology if we ourselves don't own that practice in some way. I think it's difficult. And again, I'm just challenging you to think about that, to confuse you. What is your responsibility to use technology to learn, 
at a moment when kids are using technology to learn in amazing ways. Amazing ways. Now I'm going to show you some examples of some people who don't, who, who do have a practice. And who I look at and I go, um, I'm not worried about us, really, and that, those are our kids. Kids are doing some amazing things with technologies because they're understanding the ways in which they can not only learn but connect and create things of meaning and beauty that live in the world and make a difference. This is a group of kids who are tired of being bullied and basically they decided to do something about it. They started a blog, they started a website, and you may not think that that's such a big deal, but it is a big deal. They've created a community of kids from around the world who are connecting and finding support on a regular basis around something that is, is important in their lives. And these are kids, these are teenagers, nothing to do with school. Kids who had a passion to do something, to change something, and use technology, use the web in ways that a lot of us probably wouldn't think to do. Connecting with other people and creating a community, a community of kids and learners around that particular issue. Or a 14-year-old kid in Melbourne who loved sports, started a sports blog, and over two years had all sorts of people start reading it and asking him to write for it, and it got to the point where this blog and this site got to be really um, uh, one of the main sporting sites in Australia to the point where when I was in Australia last year, he was in London covering the Australian Olympic team with a press pass at 14 years old because he cared and had a passion for sports and did this with nothing to do with school, by the way. In fact, the big decision was should he miss three weeks of school to go to London and cover the Australian Olympic team? And thankfully he did. And finally, my, my favorite, Super Awesome Sylvia. Any of you know Super Awesome Sylvia? She is super and she is awesome. And she is Sylvia too. But she is a geek. But she's a geek who loves to let her geekiness just come out and teach us all sorts of cool stuff about science. She is a kid on YouTube now who has hundreds of thousands of, of hits on all of her videos. You can learn all sorts of stuff from her, how to make rockets, how to do marbling things, tiling stuff. She's a maker, if you know what that phrase means these days. She is one of the leading kids in the maker movement. And basically, she's now gotten to the point where she's gone on Kickstarter. How many of you know Kickstarter? All right, good. So she's gone on Kickstarter now, and she has gotten funded for a watercolor replicator bot that she and a couple of adults are going to make. And basically, you'll be able to buy this kit in the next three months and I know a lot of people go, well, I don't want to replicate watercolors. I think that watercolors all should be unique. I understand that, but if a kid makes a really nice watercolor, <laughs> this is one way that you can just replicate that using technology. And because she had a passion to do it, she wanted to figure it out. She had a problem to solve, and not only did she solve it, but she did it transparently. She shared it with the world, and now she is becoming entrepreneurial and really making a lot of us stand up and take notice about how cool it is to be makers and to think about science and STEM things in a very, very different way. So it's very cool stuff. So this is really big change, and as I said before, it's not an option, I'm sorry, it's not an option. You happen to be teaching at the most disruptive time in education, sorry. For many of you, that's not what you signed up for, I get it. It was, you know, many of us, most of us, I went into teaching because I had a real picture of what teaching was like based on the teachers that I had. This is what teaching was. You came to school, you did really cool things in classrooms, you made kids think, and you can still do that. That's absolutely a fundamental part of what teaching and learning looks like in classrooms. Don't, don't in any way think that I'm suggesting we get rid of this and we get rid of those interactions. But it's not enough now just to do that. It's not enough. Because there is a required element in my kids' lives to understand connections outside of the classroom, to understand teachers outside of the classroom, to create things with other people outside of the classroom who share their passions and connect to their passions. That's required learning now. That's not an option. And as educators, we have to begin to understand what that looks like so we can do both. We can't just do one any longer. Um, that's not to say it's not important, but it's not the only thing that we can do. We have moved in the last 20 years from a world of scarcity of knowledge, information, teachers, and content to a world of absolute abundance, and abundance is overwhelming in a lot of ways. You look at these statistics, and I can throw more at you than this. Here's the one that blows my mind. Next year, one billion photos will be uploaded to the web every single day. Every single day. And my kids will take about 10,000 of those, at least. I don't know. But a billion photos a day. Think about that. And I know that 900 million of those are probably really silly and stupid and you know, pictures of desserts and Starbucks and things, right? But there's a lot of good stuff that's happening with those pictures. There's a lot of really creative, meaningful, authentic stuff that's happening there as well. 
You look at all the tools that are out there right now. This is the color wheel of web social tools. And this thing was obsolete the day it was printed. And there's no way that all of us in this room could even come close to getting our brains around all the tools that are on this particular graphic. There's just no way. Um, you know, someone asked me, I, I was doing a parent thing at Evergreen last night, and someone asked me, well, how do you make sense of all this stuff? How do you deal with all this? And I said, you need a really good network. If you don't have a really good network right now where you can reach out and say, hey, I'm a, I need something, a social streaming tool. Who's got some experience? Who's got some suggestions? I can't sort all this stuff by myself. I need connections. My kids will need connections, will need networks in their lives who can help them sort through all this information. 3D printers, anyone? 3D printers. In, in probably the next five years, many of you in this room will have a 3D printer in your, in your home or in your school where basically the idea is if you break a screw on a cabinet or something, you don't go to Home Depot anymore. You'll pull up the parts number, you'll type it into your computer, and you will print the screw on the 3D printer, take it and screw it into the wall and fix the cabinet. That tractor was printed on that device right there. And I'll show you an example of what that looks like. People think now we're going to be able to print food, believe it or not. NASA. NASA is seriously looking at can we print food? They want to send people to Mars. They're going to have to have some way of feeding those people. And so one of the things they're looking at is, can we begin to print food? And people are already printing bio materials now using 3D printers. Um, it's kind of overwhelming, and I don't know if I want to eat that or not. But anyway, and then there's Google Glass. This is the Internet of Things. How many of you have heard about Glass or have seen it? So Glass is basically this wearable device on your eye that, that you can um, tap into the Internet. You can check email. You can listen to music just by kind of using your eyes, tapping on the side of the, of the, uh, um, the uh, arm of the glasses, and, um, and this really cool thing, if you're a skier, go look up Oakley's um, goggles that basically up in the upper right hand corner, you can basically see where all your friends are on the mountain using GPS on a little picture inside the goggle. You can answer text messages as you're you know, shooting down the, the, the slopes if you want, uh, although you have to sign a waiver now from Oakley saying you won't do that, or if you do that, it's not our fault if you crash into a tree. But this is the Internet of Things. We're going to be wearing computers. My kids are going to be wearing devices, sensors of all types. I've already, I already do this, right? I, I started running again this summer. And I have an app on my phone that basically tracks where I am. It can actually send the information to Facebook or Twitter so if people see it, they can send me encouragement um, that I hear through my headphones as I'm running. Um, it's wearable connections. And, you know, we kind of giggle about it. It is kind of funny. But um, we are headed for a very, very connected, a ubiquitously connected world, a world marked by ubiquitous computing, ubiquitous information, ubiquitous networks that unlimited speed about everything everywhere from anywhere and all kinds of devices that make it ridiculously easy to connect, collaborate, um, I'm sorry, connect, organize, share, collect, collaborate, and publish it and learn. And I would ask you, how many of you would describe your schools like that? One. Very good. He's lying, he says. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> I was shocked for a minute. Um, no, and, and, but it, it doesn't describe our schools, you know? And it doesn't, it, but it describes in many ways my life. It describes in many ways my kids' life. And look, I, I totally understand that my kids are privileged, absolutely privileged. And there are lots of kids in this world that don't have these types of connections, that don't have these devices. And to be honest with you, I think it's almost a moral obligation that we get those kids connected. You can't convince me that kids without connections are going to be able to compete with kids who have connections and who importantly know what to do with those connections. It's not just having the access, that's the first step, but it's really knowing what do I do with that access to, to promote my thinking, to, to learn deeply about the things I care about, and to create and make good things that can change the world. It's an it's a, it's a enormous opportunity that not everyone has the ability to, to kind of uh, take advantage of right now. So here we are in education at this really weird moment that I'm going to call a clash of contexts. And it's basically this traditional learning context, which most people in this room probably still hold. If I asked you to describe schools, I think I would get a fairly similar definition of what happens in schools. We put kids in the same age groups, we separate them out by disciplines, we send them from, June, or from September to June, um, we assess them in certain ways. I think the stories and the characteristics that you would tell would be fairly similar. And they're built on our own narratives. They're built on our own histories. That's what school looked like for most of us. Not all of us, but for most of us, that's what school looks like. But now we have this other modern learning context. I'm giving up on 21st century. We're 14 years into it. Let's get over it. Okay? So it's in a modern learning context where we have kids and we have people with access and people with networks and connections who are looking at learning 
just very, very differently from the way it happens in classrooms. Very different. And I'm among those people. I'm a poster child for that. Um, like I said, I've been in there 13 years. Uh, I've been blogging, I've been on Twitter, I've been saving things to all sorts of social network sites um, and interacting with people from around the world on a regular basis that have pushed my thinking in ways that face-to-face -face simply can't. Face-to-face -face can't in my world where I live. There are literally only about five people in my face-to-face -face world that I can engage in a conversation like this with for more than five minutes before the eyes, their eyes roll up in the back of their heads and they say, okay, stop, stop, stop. But I can engage 24-7, 365 with really smart, really passionate, really caring people online who I have forged relationships with over the years. People who I've never met, by the way. But people who push my thinking and make me think deeply about the things that I care about. And that's what modern learning looks like. It's a very different place. It's around the difference between delivery, where basically my kids go to schools and they sit and wait to be told what to learn, when to learn, and how they're going to learn, and how they're going to be assessed on it. Every day my kids go and wait. They walk into the room and they're like, okay, what's on the agenda today? What am I learning today? As opposed to discovery. My son wants to learn Minecraft. He comes home and he learns Minecraft. He's not waiting for a book. He's not waiting for a, someone to assign, you know, go home and make a tree tonight in Minecraft, and then tomorrow we'll come in and we'll look at the tree rubric and we'll see how you did on that tree. That's not happening in his modern learning life. He's going and finding YouTube videos. He's going and finding people in his network who can teach him what he wants to learn when he wants to learn. The difference between what you want me to learn and what I want to learn. And look, there are things that you want me to learn that I need to learn. I get it. But there's also now a whole bunch of stuff that I want to learn that may actually develop me as a learner more than learning what you want me to learn. And that's an interesting question. That should confuse us. What does that mean? What does that look like? Time and place learning versus any time, anyone, anywhere. Just in case I need to know the Pythagorean theorem at some point in my life, I'm going to learn it in eighth grade. As opposed to, I need to learn the Pythagorean theorem, I can go learn it on my own. Now, I understand I need to know that I need to know the Pythagorean theorem. I get that. But my point is, how much of what we are teaching kids at a particular time and a particular moment is stuff that we're teaching them simply because it's been in the curriculum for 100 years? And that it's in there because we were basing, basing that on a world of scarcity. That if they don't get it from us, they're not going to get it anywhere else. Just a question that we have to talk about, that we have to ask. What is relevant now in a world of abundance? So, to me, it is about learning now. It's not so much about content expertise. And uh, I can tell you that if I'm a learner, I can learn just about any piece of content that I need to learn. If I understand how to leverage abundance now, I don't need you. I don't need you right now, by the way, for my kids to go to your schools to learn algebra, or to US history, learn US history, or learn chemistry. I don't need you for that anymore. They can learn that in a thousand different places. If, the, if we're gonna measure learning algebra by passing a test, I don't need you for that anymore. Because that stuff's everywhere. Shakespeare, all that stuff. It's everywhere. It's in lots of different places. And it's in environments now where the people in the room with you are all passionate about Shakespeare, rather than just a couple people who may have a passion for Shakespeare and the rest of them kind of getting through it because they know they need to get through Shakespeare. So this is a new reality. Information teachers' knowledge are abundant, and basically that supply is increasing in ways that we can't even imagine. Um, someone I read the other day, or actually on a plane coming out here yesterday, that um, all of the information that was generated in 2005 is now being generated in the next 12 hours. Um, who knows? But it is big, and it is fast, and it is a lot. We can't predict the impacts of technology. We're going to be printing food, for goodness, goodness sakes. I mean, really? What do you think's next? We have no idea what technology is going to do next. And if you think that the skills and literacies that help you guys make it through when you are in school are going to be enough to help my kids make it through when they are in school and when they're out of school, think again. How many of you teach your kids to read and write in linked environments? Teach them that. Every hand should be going up right now. Because every one of your kids is going to read and write in linked environments the rest of their lives. I mean, using links, hypertext. So they are putting hypertext links in the things that they, that they write, and they understand the new literacy of following links. There's not a person in this room that hasn't clicked on links and 10 minutes later been 10 clicks away from where they started, have no idea even how to get back to where they were. There's a literacy around that now that we're not, we're not looking at and that we're not really dealing with. So that is not the world the school was built for. School was built for a world of scarcity. This is not a world of scarcity anymore. This is a world of abundance. 
the outcomes have absolutely changed. Our personal histories are problematic now because we are bringing to our work this idea of what schooling should be based on our experience in a world that looks decidedly different from the world that my kids are growing up in. And that's a really hard thing to let go of. Those parents last night had a really hard time when I suggested that they can't expect the same type of education for their kids that they have. Because they were basically saying, but I don't want you experimenting on my kids. I want something familiar. I want to know what's happening. And I said, yeah, well, that may not be the best for your kids in terms of preparing them for the worlds that they're going to live in. So the key shift is we're moving from, in general, this institutionally organized world to a self-organized world. Now, I travel a lot. I haven't used a travel agent. I don't even know if there are travel agents that still exist, to be honest with you, because I can do that all by myself. The next book that I publish, if I publish one, probably not going to use a publisher. I can't believe that publishers are even sleeping at night um, these days, um, given the idea that we can self-publish in ways that are really easy. Um, you know, do we need a journalist to report the news? Yeah, absolutely. But we can get the news without a journalist. Now. You know, if, if you're into earthquakes, if you're studying earthquakes, you know where to go, don't you, to find out where the next earthquake is or where the, the most recent earthquakes are, and that's on Twitter. Just go on Twitter and search for the hashtag earthquake and you will find people in the middle of earthquakes going, I'm in an earthquake, it's really bad. <laughs> so, by the way, you're all journalists now. If you have, how many of you have a phone with a camera? Almost everybody in this room. You're all journalists, congratulations. So that whole thing has simply changed. We can do that on our own. And also, like I said before, a lot of the things that I used to need you for as a parent in terms of the education of my kids, I don't need you for that any longer. In fact, I may be able to find better ways of educating my kids around those content areas than what happens in classroom. Now, please don't hear me saying that there isn't value in school. There's absolute value in the face-to-face. -face. I want my kids in schools. I want them with adults who care about them. I want them with adults who are passionate, who are intelligent, who want to push their thinking, who want to challenge their thinking. I absolutely want that. But what I don't want is for simply them to go to school and go through the curriculum every single day, basically the way that I went through it. Um, that's unacceptable any longer in, in terms of my own. So the big shift here is that learning now is moving away from the institution. It is moving away from you guys and into the hands of the learner, which is a wonderful development. It is an amazingly wonderful development but it is an amazingly challenging development for us as educators. That is a huge shift that we need to understand, and I would argue embrace, even though it means a disruption at the very foundation of how we think about what schools do. That is the disruption. And I just showed this picture because I love it. <clears throat> so I want you to imagine that this is everything there is to know that we can access. This is all the content, information, and knowledge that I can pull up in my phone. It's almost the sum of human knowledge at this point. Certainly there are lots of things that aren't on there, but if you consider how much information is up there, and, and I know that not all this information is accurate, correct, this is complex, I get that, but imagine this is everything there is to know through the devices that we carry around in our pockets. Well, welcome to school. School is that one shelf up in the upper left-hand corner there that basically we cover over 12 years, and that might even be generous, to be honest with you, that basically hasn't changed very much, but basically this is what we have decided, this little box is what we have decided that every child needs to know in order to be educated, despite a world that looks like this. Now, we've always had to make choices. I get it. We've always had to make choices. But we've never had to make a choice at a time when our kids could access this. Now we have to make that choice a little bit differently. What do we teach? And basically, if this is every potential teacher in the world, 2.5 people, 2.5 billion people in the world, 5 billion by the end of this decade that will be connected online, and I look at those people as potential teachers. I know some of them are predators, I know some of them aren't good people, I get it, but I have to tell you, if you, took, if you told me that I could only learn with people in my face-to-face -face world, you would be eliminating 99% of my learning opportunities with people who I've connected to around the world right now. You would be saying to me, you cannot take advantage of the intelligence, passion, work, and all the connections that are possible to me now. I don't know what I would do, to be honest with you. So I look at this picture and I go, these are, these are potential teachers in my life. 
potential people who I can learn with. If these are, it represents all those 2.5 billion people welcome to school, and that is not to say that these people aren't hardworking, caring, intelligent, passionate, good human beings who I want to have in my kids' classrooms, I 